Okay, this is the November 21st meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. I'd like to remind everybody of the IPR policy, which we abide by, and only people and companies listed on the page are allowed to make substantive contributions. So welcome, and we're going to cover a lot of stuff today, very packed agenda. So let's get to it. The slides are published on the wiki. And the meetings uh, being recorded. Do we have volunteers for note taking? I'll take care of it. Thank you, Doc. All right. A reminder about the code of conduct, which we operate under. Please keep it professional. I think you already know how to use Google Meet, so don't need to talk too much about there. But please state your name and don't jump the queue. Uh, we'll talk about document status, and here's the agenda. We're going to start with the grab bag, which has a lot of stuff in it, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through most of it. So we'll kick that off right now, and I think the first uh, issues are from Henrik and Harold. So I think this one is Harold, background blur. Yeah, so this, this is actually... Um, the same thing as uh, we have later in the agenda for three thumbs up. Oh, okay. Which is, uh, yeah, you see, you see the, you see the slides. Um, Elad, are you, uh, do, are you, do you agree that it's uh, three thumbs up? Uh, I've not read these particular things, but yeah, three thumbs up is both the mute as well as effects. And today we intend to focus more on mute. Um, so up to you whether you want to discuss this or not. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the basic thing is that so we should have, it would be much easier for the use cases that are covered by three thumbs up, which is that we have multiple layers of application that, uh, application and OS and browser that all seem to have an opinion about whether the effect should be applied. So it would be a nice principle to say, uh, it, if you add capabilities, you must support the constraint equals false. That is to say that uh, the application must be able to get at the unprocessed video feed. So, comments about that? Rio? Yeah, it sounds nice, but... Uh, mm mac os might not be able to uh, support it at a platform level from an implementation level windows yes uh, we from when i think about i just saw it today so windows it is possible chrome os also i think it is possible but uh, un do you think on mac os it's implementable constraint equal to false Um, so cur currently, some OSs for, for some OSs it's not possible. That's right, Riju. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether it will be uh, possible in the future or not. I cannot predict future. Uh, but what I know is that um, may, having this mast is not implementable in some OSs. So I would be fine with some words saying, "Hey, if the OS is providing it, or if it's feasible uh, to." Uh, to implement it, uh, please support it, because I think it's useful. Uh, but if it's uh, not feasible for a particular camera to disable background blur, I do not think we should remove the ability to actually expose this camera. Uh, so I would say mask there is not appropriate. So, uh, I mean, these uh, problems are really new, so it would, uh seem that it, this is still being worked out. And um, so uh, it wouldn't be the first time we were un unable to get the must supported in the first version. Um, so uh, but we could have a, a text saying must be supported uh, and with a note saying that, but we want, we, we know that not everyone will. Hey. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's useful uh, to expose to the web application 
that uh, Valgrand blur is enabled. It's anyway useful. Uh, and the alternative, if, if, you, if we say must support constraint equal false, basically user agents that cannot implement it will just not implement Bagot Blur at all. And so... Yep. Um, so you can you say are. should, but must is not good. Hmm. Yep, so... I'll try to make a pull request saying some something like uh, some something like uh, should, but uh, unless you really uh, and you should have a really good reason not to. Okay, we have uh, uh, Elad, your polka pig. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, so I just want to say that background blur is uh, absolutely uh, very interesting uh, and definitely a problem that we want to solve, but it's actually, uh, uh, it's one of several other issues, right? Like it's all sorts of effects, any kind of effect that you can imagine and any kind of uh, post-processing you can do on the image. And uh, this can be applied either from the user agent or from the operating system. And um, basically I, would like to say that if we could have a bit more time to just think about this uh, and come up with um, a better opinion next time, uh, that would be great because uh, it's a relatively um, complicated space. And I'm just afraid that if we make any decisions now, it would tie our hands going forward. Yep. Uh, so okay. I, yeah. Yeah. if you could give us until December to kind of come back with uh, a more general uh, approach maybe that could uh, generalize to more effects that would be great so uh, we'll uh, we'll feed this into making a suggestion and then uh, discuss it probably in january since like december is full already bernard yeah um for audio we had a similar problem and and the solution was uh, to have a, a a mode where you just request no processing so, and, and the reason I think that might be a little bit uh, better than this is that you don't have to try to figure out what all the effects are. You just say, don't do, don't do any, any of this stuff. Um, so it would apply even to new effects that you might not even know about. Um, that would be my concern. If something new crops up and now you have to like have a constraint, support constraint equal false, you don't even know that it was coming. Uh, yeah, that's what's what. What I kind of feel with the background processing, Janiva. Yeah, sorry, I came in late, so I missed the intro, but I think I get it. Uh, my concern is with, uh, I think, with media capabilities, saying uh, it's not appropriate for capabilities to say uh, we can't say that uh, oh, it must do anything, right? So the all the capabilities can do is reflect accurately reflect what is and what isn't available. So I, I don't think uh, if an, if an OS only supports blur and no way to turn it off from the user agent, for example, then uh, we wouldn't we shouldn't put a user agent in a bind where it cannot implement the spec properly. They would need to not support that camera. Well, we did we did tell the OS to support VP8, so we have pre precedent for supporting unpopular things, Tim. Yeah, I, again, I didn't hear the very beginning of this, so I may be um, off off target here. But I'd be personally quite surprised if um, if I selected that I wanted background blur at the OS level in the you know in the settings somewhere, and then I found that actually that wasn't happening because the browser decided it didn't want it. Like that seems like a bit of a you know, a um, bit of a surprise. So I, I think we need to be a bit careful, particularly about, because this is essentially a privacy issue, Blur. Um, and I don't think it's the same as some of the other transforms. And I, I, so I slightly disagree with the lab there that I don't think it necessarily has the same rules as some of the others, because people enable Blur because they don't want people to know their environment. Um, so I, I think we have to be a bit bit more careful with this one than maybe with you know some of the others thank you
Um, hello again. I think we should stop stop on this one because there's more in the grab bag. Okay, in that case, never mind. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're we're planting, we're continuing discussion on the bug and uh, privacy privacy things in uh, OS implementability and uh, and. Uh, uh, whether 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 all the all the facts are are to be treated the same that's good questions so i'll leave it to Hendrik to talk about uh, audio sets all right this is a follow up uh, on some disagreements so, so the uh, in past virtual interims we agreed to add the uh, the ability to calculate uh, or notice when frame audio frames are dropped and calculate uh, glitch a glitch ratio as shown on the slide, um, and then uh, on on GitHub, there's been uh, developing uh, disagreements. So here I am trying to to follow up on it uh, in a virtual interim. So uh, audio frames can be dropped. Um, so here's some different reasons why it could be dropped. Uh, it can be dropped by the OS uh, due to di device bugs, OS bugs, CPU starvation, uh, user agent underperforming, uh, etc. And different OSs could uh, also, some of them can do this with claim stamps. Others have some info, like uh, or, or they can be dropped inside the user agent due to uh, IPC delays, uh, processing delays, or, or bugs. Um, so the, the contention here is that glitches are rare and difficult for an app to uh, affect. So on the next slide, so the, the alleged problem is that, and uh, feel free to replace this later, uh, but the, the alleged problem is that frame drops are usually a sign of UAE bugs. Uh, and if they happen, uh, bug or not, the app can't save itself. It's uh, catastrophic. And so the conclusion uh, has been that maybe this should not be exposed to JavaScript. And, and this is the core of the disagreement. So Google disagrees with, uh, both the premises and the conclusion. We argue that uh, apps needs to monitor quality. Uh, one of the reasons is A-B testing, and we do have some real world data uh, showing that rolling out app features does uh, affect glitches, at least in Chrome. Um, and this also exercises new code paths, either in JavaScript or inside the user agent. And whenever you do anything like this, you can either improve or regress quality, including glitches. So this is something we want to, to measure for, for that reason. And that's why we want to measure it inside the app. But also for understanding uh, app-specific bug reports. Um, so if you re report a bug in Meet, uh, you will upload graphs. And someone can take a look at them and analyze, you know, is the bad audio due to the OS, user agent, device, app bugs, Capture stack, etc. I think recently there was a, is a regression in in a Mac version. Um, so we want to be able to also flag if something's wrong. So if, if quality is bad, we want to we want to know about it basically. Uh, and and we would argue that uh, the app being able to identify issues in general is a good thing. So other anecdotes like really poor devices uh, running in the cloud. Uh, you have or orders of magnitude more issues and it's good to be able to measure um and and we've seen some interest from teams go to meetings and zoom when we uh did an intent to protest so we, we need a decision here and and paul feel free to add your thoughts i don't want to misrepresent anything you say but basically i'd like a decision on whether audio frames should be exposed to javascript Thoughts. Yes, Tim. Yeah, so I, I think it. There's no reason why not to uh, expose them, and I think there are some subtle things the app can do to improve the situation. So it, I don't even think it's catastrophic. So, like, you can change the p time, or you could ch you can change the fact. Um, and if you knew, know you're losing 7% of packets, then you, you want to turn the feck up. So I think that's entirely do in the, it's useful for the app to be able to see this. 
Okay, Yuan? Yes. Um, so I think it's somehow fine as long as there's no uh, fingerprinting issue, uh, which maybe there is somehow. Uh, so we should look at that. Um, if you're able to detect that uh, a device is always buggy and is always uh, having this kind of audio drops, uh, maybe, maybe there's something uh, there or maybe there's not. That's something we should look at. Um, I think we should have the same uh, discussion for video frame drops. And uh, there, at least on macOS and OS, there's no way that video frames can be dropped uh, from camera to uh, the media stream track. So there I would question the, the usefulness for this one. Seems to be there seems to be different uh yeah, I'll, I'll user agent different. implementations. No, I I mean there seems to be multiple ways that uh, both audio and video stacks have been uh, implemented. Uh, uh over to Paul. Um so to answer Tim, this is about local things right so there is no packets there is no network there is no nothing um it's capture capture device cap I wasn't kidding. microphone to the page that's uh, so it's all in software or local uh, to uh to answer you when um if there is a certain device that shows issue then it's a responsibility of the implementation to know about it we all have telemetry and we know uh, we can know about this um, very much like you said uh, for video on mac os um, firefox cannot drop uh, audio from the microphone to the web page like there is it cannot happen um, if the machine is overloaded and especially if the machine is overloaded with real-time threads, then yes, at this point, uh, it, it will break. But that also means that your machine cannot run regular threads, right? So it's kind of an edge case. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the idea is that if this happens, then it's an architecture problem in the web browser. That's what I'm saying, right? And that should be fixed and not exposed to the web. Because that's we, we we don't we don't really add APIs to the web to diagnose user agent uh, implementation issues. Um, mind you, I am very much in favor of a symmetrical API for the video side, which is not real time and which is supposed to drop. Uh, in particular, it is supposed to drop if there is not enough CPU and audio takes priority. As we all know, perceptually, when making calls, if the audio is smooth and video is dropping a bit, uh, it's a lot better than the opposite. Uh, and that's why thread priorities are set this way and has always been set this way uh, as long as there's been audio in computers. Um, so yeah, th this is the reason why we shouldn't, we shouldn't expose this to JavaScript. Uh, if somehow a web application is able to do something on the web page that fixes the audio then we are in the presence of an implementation bug i i think you would be amazed uh how some of the bad devices out there and when we anytime we do a performance related experiment we we do see we do see differences here um so I'm not comfortable saying this is just due to user agent bugs, and I'm not comfortable saying there's nothing we can do about it because we've measured that we can improve things. Um, but I mean, if if user agents could be implemented in a better way, uh, that's that's one thing. But I don't think we can mandate no issues. And I kind of even if I, I don't agree with that, this is just user agent bug. But even if it was only user agent bug. I still see value in it being able to measure what's happening, especially in user uh, bug reports, uh, stuff like that. Uh, anyway, Harl? Yeah, oh, so uh, there are three parties in this game. It's the platform, 
it's the user agent and it's the app and in my opinion all three have the opportunity to mess up audio some of them have to work harder than others to mess it up but all of the, all three of them can mess it up independently and many user agents are running on multiple OSs, multiple versions of OSs that have different bugs, different features. Uh, and so there will not be one case that is the thing. There will be many cases of co these combinations. Now, you, Paul mentioned instrumentation, telemetry. The use case of WebRTC itself is so small that you have to have dedicated telemetry to make it show up at all. There will be no general alarm in Chrome telemetry watchers because of something that only happens in WebRTC conferences. So having the ability to have the application report on what happens when it runs and not in the general case when the user agent runs is i think critically important so i think my conclusion is we should expose this to js yeah okay who's next tim are you you're next on the list Oh, you. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, at the risk of digging down into the weeds, I'm in the implementation weeds. Is it really the case that changing the the frame rate, i.e., the p time, makes no impact on the and and changing the encoder settings makes no impact on the that, thread so behavior? This is... It seems slightly surprising. It makes Tim, no this impact is, on this the stuff between encoding. the microphone and the and the and the pair connection it makes an impact on the on the on the thing between pair connection and so no, so no. adding uh, load adding load could in theory affect uh the ability to do processing so the two questions the drop is measured before it reaches the encoder but if you add encoder load and that stresses the system that could affect the timing of things in the system so and coming coming back to the thing about the the p time are you like is the sample rate from the microphone not affected i mean i'm thinking about my own implementation our own implementation the sample rate that comes from the microphone is driven by the p time like there's no point in sampling faster than p time so you don't so i don't know how it's done on on in chrome i've never looked but like if i change the p time in the in the sdp then the 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 thread that's talking to the microphone will sample slower Oh, I I don't know about that. Actually, no, I I don't have any experience with that. I, I mean, I've uh, never looked at the low level, so I have no idea how how it works, and I don't even know. If, yeah, hmm, I think it's a setting on on macOS. I think it's a setting you can say like how big your your buffer is, and based on how frequently you want to grab it. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I. I I, it, I, right. What I'm trying to say is, it's not implausible to me that there are things that you could do in the app that would influence this. And even if you couldn't, you'd still want to know. I, I think maybe, but I think ultimately, the the sampling rate is probably a user agent implementation. I'm guessing. Uh, but let's go to Joanne and then to Paul. Yeah. So uh, the first thing I would say is that native apps have access to this info, um, and yeah, maybe they could like. Uh, mute capture, uh, mute uh, video rendering, and if they detect so, I, I don't know. Uh, if they are doing so, then I do not think uh, we should prevent uh, JavaScript to uh, do the same kind of strategies, uh, except if there's like actual uh, privacy or sec security issues. Uh, I don't think it's the case, but it's still worth uh, discussing that. Also, to the point of telemetry, um, user agent telemetry is different from web page telemetry uh, and for this particular case uh, the, the user actually granted permission to a microphone 
So I'm more confident in uh, having web page telemetry than generic user agent telemetry where uh, uh, it's, it, it's a bit different, uh, I think. So but that's why I think we should still move on with this uh, thing there. Okay, Paul? I'd like to stress the fact that there is nothing you can do in the web page that will change the complexity of the CPU usage on the real time thread that is used for input. There is exactly have... one thing disabling AEC and that kind of thing. That's the only thing, right? We, we have real world data from Google Meet where, so it wasn't capture, uh, it was play out, play out uh, glitch rather than capture glitch, but it's, it's a similar situation where frames are, are being uh, handled by the user agent and get lost somewhere due to timing. And we, we do see that, that, for example, if you use a hardware or a, a software encoder, does affect this. And we've also seen that uh, particular users with particular, especially bad devices, will have orders of, of magnitude more glitches than normal users. And it's hard to imagine that if you are on a particularly bad, in a particular bad environment, that the performance of the web page has no impact on uh, the risk of glitch. Yes, on yeah. but field world measurement. I, we, I think we're going to need to move on because we have uh, about seven more issues to do in this segment. Okay. What's the conclusion? Agree to disagree? No, it's still wrong. It shouldn't happen. If we should be in service of the user, and user agent should be fixed. Uh, and we know I they aren't because you still see problems. Uh, I'm hearing a rough consensus of everyone but Paul. So that suggests that we should ask Paul to think carefully about this, because I think you're wrong. Well, I've, well uh, no, I don't think I am. Okay. Well, I would like to support uh, Paul on this, and I think that uh, from we're talking about adding an API, not specifically for the user, but for web browsers. And as a web browser, I don't think Mozilla has a need to implement this, so we would not implement this. So I, I think that is an objection, right? Right. It seems like you're ignoring uh, the fact that we do affect this in real world experiments. I mean, you, it seems like your precision is is any any measurement of a drop is just a sign of a user agent bug. Yes. Okay. Well, let's move on. Okay. Yes, this is a follow up on exposing decode errors, in particular software fallback as an event. We have had a discussion in the media working groups on the issue of web codecs and how they, those errors are exposed there. And we're trying to align with that proposal. So we are going, would like to go for encoding error for input data errors. We're going to omit the RID identifier for simulcast until we see this is solving an actual problem. We are going for a operation error to indicate a resource problem, which means a fallback from hardware to software. Since privacy came up the last time, I checked and we had a comment from the privacy folks that such an approach would be OK. The question is, can we consider this ready for PR? UN. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, the comment from uh, PESC. And uh, I, I do not read it as uh, actually uh, privacy seems fine there. It says if you expose the, uh, the if, if another web, web page can trigger the operation error somehow, or with the two web pages, if it can coordinate somehow and trigger the operation error, 
uh, then it's uh, it's not good. It's only if uh, it's fully isolated from other websites, from other web pages. And uh, I do not see how uh, this could be the case. Uh, that does not mean we should not go for PR, uh, because usually for those issues, uh, the devil is sometimes in, in the details. So we could try we, to go with the PR, but uh, I think that uh, before uh, merging it, we, we will need uh, a closer look uh, from uh, uh, all members and also from the privacy folks. Mm -hmm. That sounds good to me. OK. All right. Okay, then. Next slide. OK. So this one is about another privacy issue. Um, it started in WebRTC stats, uh, which contains the following text, basically the limiting um, was, was for stats saying that uh, hardware capabilities should only be exposed in capture and context. Um, so Ping filed an issue on WebRTC SVC about use of scalability mode discovery for hardware fingerprinting. Okay, so uh, first thing to understand is that whoever to see SVC uh, uses the Media Capabilities API, which is developed in the Media Working Group for Discovery. Um, and Media Capabilities tells you if a configuration is supported, power efficient, or smooth. Um, but as far as I know, Media Capabilities API is not limited to capture context. Um, so you can call us API whether or not you have capture context. Um, the second problem is that SVC is rarely supported in hardware. So I'll show you an example, but it's pretty rare to find a device that has supports power efficient SVC. I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, and typically people use simulcast instead because of the power uh, efficiency is better for simulcast. You can get power efficient there. Um, so it's hard to see how you could use scalability mode for hardware fingerprinting if it's not actually supported in hardware. And then the third thing is that uh, from the point of view of the WebRTC SVC API, um, we expose less than what's in media capabilities because um, when you call set parameters or transceiver, you might get an error, but that's only the equivalent of whether it's supported. It doesn't tell you whether it's power efficient or smooth. So here is what a typical case will look like. This is a MacBook Air M2 on Safari Tech Preview which has among the best uh, hardware support there is. And there you can see that none of the modes, some of the modes are supported, uh, uh, but um, not for, they're not smooth or power efficient. So even there where, where you have uh, the best hardware support you can probably get for codecs in general, you, you don't have anything. Uh, you don't get any info on, on power efficiency. And this is the, Chrome GPU exposed to the same machine. So there is, in fact, a bunch of hardware acceleration uh, on both decoding and encode, but uh, not exposed with respect to SVC. Um, uh, Henrik? Uh, I think it's not entirely <laughs> accurate. So for example, on Chrome OS, you can do L3T3 key in hardware. That shows that it's power efficient. On Windows, we currently do L1 T1, so power efficient. Uh, there are patches to, so there's what the user agent has, there's what the, the device can do, then there's what the user agent has implemented. And then it's like if power efficient is, is uh, accurately reflected here. So uh, I know that on Windows, there's a very large number of devices where uh, L1 T2 is possible to do on the driver. It's just not been turned on inside the the uh, user agent. So there's a flag coming for L1 T2. L1 T3, I know uh, it's supported in the driver. It's not supported in the browser. And then I'm not quite sure if the driver, what the driver does is spec compliant or not. But anyway, there are different values here and you, you could actually get out uh, the point is there. that's that info has gotten from the media capabilities api which is not where the bug was filed um so yeah. yes so yeah. there is this chicken and the egg kind of problem where you know there's one api exposes something and then another ex api exposes basically the same thing 
and then they're both pointing to each other saying yeah well, well you already exposed is, it no that no this doesn't expose the same thing the point is it doesn't mm. uh whether it's the svc in in whether it's gpc all you get is whether it's supported not power efficient or smooth you don't actually get the same info um yeah it's media capabilities that provides the more the the uh, power efficiency, which relates to hardware, not the web or the SVC idea. Right. Yeah. You need to do, do yeah, you know, you need to look at encoder implementation for that. And, right. But that's already gated. Yeah. So um, this is the text in web or SVC, which basically says if you uh, set a codec value, um, you can get, uh, you basically, if you get an error, it means it's it's not supported. Um, so that's basically how you would get the information on whether it's supported or not, but you can't get power efficient or smooth. So uh, the proposed resolution of this bug is we've actually filed issue 209 on the Media Capabilities API, um, since that's the one that exposes the hardware info now where about the SVC. So we're going to discuss this in the Media Working Group. Um, and if the Media Working Group decides to limit Media Capabilities to capture context, we'll bring a proposal back. To provide the equivalent support in Weber to CPC. Uh, but basically, we're going to file this bug where it actually exists, which is in media capabilities, not in the Weber to CSVC API for the moment. Comments? Well, I, I'm next on the queue, uh, but I think uh, what Bernard said and uh, Henrik said already was the one I'm going to say that, you know, but I would just add that even if it so hardware support is limited today. It doesn't mean it will be tomorrow. SBC, if we're judging by use it and uh, how people take it for granted, VP9 seems very popular. So even if it's just Chromebooks today, it might be more platforms tomorrow. But I agree with the general idea that uh, take this issue back to media capabilities. Uh, the existing capture check uh, might seem a slam dunk to the privacy group, but uh, we should. I, where we should push back, I think, is that uh, even though we've done this for things like IP mode in the past, there are use cases, not all use cases uh, allow web applications to ask for camera or microphone ahead of time, like uh, for games and data channel. And also uh, piggybacking on, on a, a much serious permission like camera and microphone is actually a permission escalation. So if we can find a solution. So unless our API, uh, adds more information than equivalent APIs, I think we should push back uh, or look for other solutions. And yeah. time warning, we're, uh, uh, we're over time for this segment. Yeah, I think, so what do people want to do? I think we have a couple more, uh, couple more issues we can continue, but then something else will probably get pushed off the agenda. Uh, what do you think, Harold? Do we just move to the next segment? You're so, muted, Harold. This is what we're discussing, these three issues, 212, 75, and 2170. Sounds like we, people agree that media capabilities should solve this. I think we can move on. OK. Yeah, the question is, we're out of time for the segment. Should we, we just uh, push to the SCP codec negotiation? So uh, just a comment, we don't have any grab bags for uh, next month's interim. So if we could, uh, I, I'm fine presenting my slide uh, next interim if we had uh, short slots for it. OK. But uh, there's none at the moment, so that's just a concern. That we may not be able to get to those issues uh, until January. All right. That's what we'll do. Thank you. All right. Turning over the floor to Harold. Thank you. So, in the spirit of uh, ha trying to find uh, uh, commonly acceptable solutions, I've gone through the the STP negotiation API with with Yanivar, who thought that it was too complicated, and revised the proposal to make it simpler. So. Uh, there's now a transceiver add codec function that says, here's here's what the codec is called in for STP, and here's what how you packetize it for the packetizer. And uh, we should do exactly the same like as a transform and only permit it while the transceiver is being created. 
No, it's a, it's a completely, well, people don't like to, to be careful about so catching all the cases where transceivers are created. So I added a utility helper that just says, okay, the pair connection will do it for you. So functionality should be the same as the previous uh, su suggestion. It's just that the API shape is different. Next slide. So naturally, there's not universal agreement when you suggest something new. So we never made a comment uh, both in the bug and in other meetings that uh, like we about these editors about should the API be on the transceiver or should be on it be on transform. Now, I think based on my experience with putting uh, APIs in and where I think we want uh, the APIs to go, that it's the right decision to place it on transceiver. I mean, transceiver is already closely entangled with the uh, STB negotiation. It's where we set other functions like uh, set colleague preferences that only affect STP negotiation, while the transform is only concerned with moving frames, just like the sender and receiver. And if we ever get to the point where we can create a sender or receiver that we can use without STP, we still may have transforms in them. We shouldn't have to connect with STP just be, or neuter the calls that uh, go to STP just because we made an inappropriate choice. So on the other, other side, if we ever get to the one ended transforms, which is unlikely to be a transform as you and as uh, suggested, we will have use cases that need to affect STP negotiation. So again, separation of concern says that we will have transceivers we won't have transforms. We will have something else. So we should put it on the uh, on the on the trans transceiver. And uh, next slide. So here's the API linkages that uh, roughly go into doing an STP negotiation. You have an application uh, that does the API. That should be a yellow API, no? Not agree on. It talks to the transceiver. It also talks to the PC, um, and it is also transform, of course. Uh, browser capabilities, transceiver state, all inform STP negotiation. STP negotiation causes and transceive uh, senders and receivers to be created. Uh, in some cases, it uh, in other cases they're cre created uh, together with the transceiver. Uh, so this seems a bit tidy. Next slide. Now, if the API was on transform, the application would have to talk to talk to the transform, and the transform would have to talk to STP. So I think that's a bad design. So let's uh, discuss that particular point since it seems to be an outstanding one. Jan uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for making the, the slides here. Uh, so I would point out that uh, the transform in between encoder and packetizer here, that's the transformer object that's on the worker. So that's not the object we're talking about. We're talking about the RTC, RTP script transform object that you assign sender.transform to. And that object is, is a main thread object that basically says, um, you know, here's a transform that I created that will modify the signal in, in a certain way. And I think an argument to that would be, and here's the codec that this should be negotiated as. And uh, if I, and the reason it belongs on the transform is because uh, it is an inherent property of the transform. In fact, if I if I don't like, I have a choice. I can use the script transform, in which case I need to specify what this made up codec should be, 
But if I specify instead an S frame transform, then it's already understood what it is. Uh, and I think as far as SDP and transceivers, I think uh, I'm not going to say transceivers was a mistake. I think it had serves its purpose, but I think it's definitely not the most popular object in, in the standard. Um, and it was created to hold things that didn't fit anywhere else, like direction changes and stop and uh, codec preferences because their order uh, M lines apparently can't. Um, it, it's probably simpler to implement that you can specify an order that goes directly to the M line. Whether that was a mistake or not, uh, it doesn't change that we shouldn't organize. I don't think we should organize APIs around SDP. We should organize it around functionality and behavior from a web developer's perspective. And I think it would be a mistake to allow them to forget or remember to set a transform separately from forgetting or remember to set to specify the codec that that transform represents. We can certainly make them uh, remember the last one. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, the purpose of uh, isolating SDP is to not entangle SDP with stuff that we might want to use without SDP. So uh, keeping the distinction is a good, is a good point to me. And let me see. Janiva again? I, I also I forgot I to saw someone else on the queue, but uh, they seem to drop off. Uh, you made another comment that senders and receivers are sometimes created later, but, that, but transceiver, sender, and receiver are always created at the same time. They're essentially the same object. They're, yes, they're strongly linked at the moment, yes. Yuan? So uh, I haven't particularly uh, studied deeply this uh, subject, but um, the, the thing I, I like to understand is uh, if at some point we will have yeah, the uh, S-frame packetization, we, will, we have the S-frame transform, and we will probably want the S-frame transform to somehow uh, retarget uh, the uh, the data to to the actual S frame transform and to a S frame packetization, and I'm I'm wondering whether um, the exercise of understanding hey we have the S frame transform we, we want to do that and that uh, th that gives uh, uh, an infrastructure and this API is also somehow defining an infrastructure and I, I don't know how they. Uh, are how, whether they are coherent or whether they are not coherent. So maybe making the exercise of uh, understanding precisely how S frame would fit in, into that when we have the uh, native implementations of both transform and packetization might help drive uh, the design of uh, uh, the model and the API. The fact that S frame has not worked up this is a good point. So uh, when uh, so when installing an, an S frame transform, SDP has to be affected. Unfortunately, we can't say how, but exactly how, because uh, S frame spec isn't done on that point yet. I think, Bernard, uh, is that true? Is it clear how to signal the S frame in SDP? Right, it doesn't cover RTP. That's in the S frame RTP packetization spec. Yep. So is that ready? Or is it still a work in progress? Uh, Peter, <laughs> when are you going to cover that? I mean, it's still a work in progress, right? We just yeah. had a meeting where we had some issues we need to figure out. Feel free to file bugs on the spec, Harold. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm just... Uh, just worrying about depend depending on uh, things to guide our architecture with, with, when these things are not necessarily ready. Henrik? I think this diagram you showed, it, it represents well my, my mental model of, of the, the, this situation. Uh, John Eva mentioned that there's a difference between the script transform on the main thread and the actual transform. But 
that that aside this this like in my in my mind an, an m section and a transceiver they map one to one and so necessarily the transceiver inside the implementation the transceiver will have to deal with all of this so what i'm trying to wrap my head around is in the in the in, G in geneva's proposal where the transform contains information about sdp um would the would the only difference be that the transceiver asks the transform object hey what's your what's your uh, uh pay payload type basically um I i'm wondering if you could you could draw the same model but instead of having the transform draw an error to sdp module oh. you basically just at initialization time the transceiver asks the transform what's the payload type and then the arrow still goes to the mm. sdp module no well okay or does I think the timing I, of the api change I'm sorry i think this That's sorry we, we're done I, I was i was eager to answer your question <laughs> no that, but that was my question I'm, I'm wondering if is there a huge difference between between app at, say telling the transceiver or transform telling the transceiver like will it be the same number of methods calls in the end no, so I'm happy to show a slide next meeting. Um, you could look in the issue as well that uh, my API I'm envisioning is much simpler than this uh, because uh, what you have here is you have to add the codec and the transform as two separate steps. And I would simplify that by making it uh, a constructor argument. So you basically say center transform equals new RTC RTP script transform with uh, a worker and an options ar argument of uh, here's the uh, pretend codec to use and and that falls out nicely if you use an s-frame transform instead you don't need that argument so and the the diagram here i think is confusing because uh there's no involvement of a worker thread here but that, that's totally separate so it's a transceiver since the method has already been moved to the transceiver uh it's it's uh synchronously identical to the user agent to get this information uh at the assignment of the sender so and the sender is already tied one to one anyway it's not like you can really make uh, dynamic assignments and reuse transforms so i think that's and also i don't think there's a need for S i don't think sdp should guide us that's an architectural decision that is not really should shouldn't really impact the api anymore i think that's been true since ad track uh, generates things that need negotiation and uh, create data channel. A lot of things, uh, a lot of API modifications require uh, negotiation. So we don't. There's not true that a transceiver is the negotiation negotiation object. So I'm happy to present the slide next week um, with with uh, my my preferred API for this. Uh, your your API currently lacks the the designation of uh, packetizers. Well, an, another pushback was that uh, currently the add codec method takes two arguments, which are both codecs, and there was some confusion about which one's which. And I think therefore it's simpler to uh, because one of them is uh, the codec, and the other one is the packetization mode of a known codec and i think it would be since the first one's going to be made up anyway i think it's easier simpler api to make make the packetization mode a property of that made up codec that would that would add an extra argument to the dictionary yes i will look look forward to seeing a more complete more com complete proposal for that all right I'm happy to present the slide for that. It's already available in YouTube for those who want to uh, head head start. Oh, it's not 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 the one not 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 worked out to the degree that I understand it. All right, well, I'm happy to work with uh, flushing it out. Okay, I have one more slide on the issue, which uh, was and a di different thing I came up with uh, just in recent days, in that uh, in the code I wrote the sample code i always said okay when you when you get a negotiation done you know what the pay payload type is and then you modify the, pay the payload type as appropriate so 
the payload type is a lookup key where that goes into a map, uh, mapping table in uh, in the well in the in the center of the receiver actually not the transceiver uh, but uh, the result of the lookup is a mime type uh, we've added frames to, uh, a mime type to frames uh, which is a PC independent independent indication, but it's a more complex mat matching function. So, when we transform a frame, which of those should be the one that the, the transform needs to change to indicate what the format of the result is? People. I would say the payload type because the mine type is derived is derived from the payload type, so you shouldn't be able to change it independently. So the mine type is the result of a lookup of the of the payload payload type. Yes. yes. Uh, any other? Yeah, that's interesting. I was about to say the opposite, but uh, people might have a point. Uh, well, I, I tend to focus on simplifying API, so MIME type seems simpler, but if it allows us to over-specify, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, but making it simpler on JavaScript to not find them. Uh, so how, how would you find the payload type? You would just go dig yeah, it out of... Uh, basically, do get parameters and then rummage through the codex. Right. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, Hendrik? Uh, I don't know if there's any hidden downsides here, but if, if this is a map one-to-one -one thing, I, I think it's more ergonomic to just say string codec and then let the guts of the peer connection do the uh, transformation for you. Um, but I don't know if there's any hidden downsides to that. But payload type, I always found it very cumbersome, the idea that you have to you have to look up the payload type, which changes all the time, and it's a basically random number, and then it, it's just an extra step. And I don't see it, I don't know if there's any upsides to that, but it could be. And uh, another little problem I encountered is that, that the way, if we move a frame between pair connections, the payload type may not may not have the same meaning in 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 both pair connections, but the mime type will have the same meaning. Yeah, I I, I remember distinctly that 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 was an issue, and it was very cumbersome. And I thought if 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 a mime type was the identifier, this would just work automatically, and you you wouldn't have to care about payload type. You um, I would I would tend to go with uh, payload type. Um, the fact that payload type and my type might get out of sync. Uh, we should look at that. Maybe it begs the idea that uh, there should be a separate field for uh, bucketization because somehow we have, we have normally we have the encoder and the bucketization and it's, there's a strong relationship. And now we are trying to, to split them and one can go with whatever bucketization. So maybe it, it should be a, a new field and you should not be able to change the payload type or the mime type uh, so that it, it stays in sync somehow. If it's an interface getter, you could have updating either would also update the other one. But I'm not sure that works if you're transferring the frame. Never mind. Ignore me. Yeah, you you could you could specify that, but once you enqueue a frame, it looks up the payload type and there and set sets the mind type from that, or it looks up the mind type and sets the payload type from that. And if it can't find the mapping, it drops it on the floor. Yeah, I think that would be nice. That got a thumb up from my Philip. Okay, so uh, I'm hearing some... Well, if I, if I were to assign a tendency sli slightly in favor of mind type, but... Uh, we, ha we certainly haven't argued this this one out, and uh, I'll uh, try to summarize in the bug. Okay, with that, we're 
on, only three minutes over time. And we'll leave it to Bernard, RTB Transport. I think I'll actually be the one presenting here. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right, so this is a preview of what I'm going to talk about. Hopefully I'll have time. Review the current state, uh, talk about some related API discussions, and respond to feedback from last time. Now, first, we're reviewing the current state, <clears throat> which is that previously we agreed that there, uh, we had general agreement that we wanted to add an API for sending, receiving RTP and RTCP packets for purposes of many use cases like custom payloads and packetization and custom protection and custom metadata, et cetera, by incrementally building on the peer connection encoded streamer web codex. So we made a repository, and it has an explainer, and it also has a skeleton spec. So there's some links on the slides there. And now we're iterating on that. So that's where we're currently at. Some related API discussions. First, bandwidth estimation. So Harold had a, a proposal for an API for bandwidth estimation. And my proposal is that we build such an API on top of RTP transport. So here's a simplified version of Harold's proposal that's kind of built on top of RTP transport. Um, similar to what he had, uh, there's an event that says something changed. And then there's an attribute for uh, the information. Here, I just put the, uh, the bandwidth estimate value, nothing about allocation, although I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so basically, I think that the things that we're doing that are of interest, like bandwidth estimation, um, are a natural fit for RTB transport. And we should probably add it to the RTB transport spec as part of RTB transport. So next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, I forgot to mention. This would also be uh, of more value if there were a way to get to an RTP transport independent of what I presented last time with the create RTP transport method that would add an inline for wildcard. Um, and if you could get to it with an existing inline. So I think that we could do so by just adding attributes to the RTP sender and receiver like we have for DTLS transport, uh, except now for RTP transport. Uh, okay. So, do you want to take questions on, on the way, or wait wait until the end? Yeah, we can we can take a question now. Who's, who's... Yeah. So, uh, my question was: the, the RTP transport here is for both sending and receiving. It's, there's not a sender one and a receiver one, right? Correct. We'll we'll get to that uh, okay. as part of responding to feedback from last time. But yes, right here, it's it's both. There's one RTP transport object, not two. Uh, Stefan had his hand up too. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about what it would look like um, for a user of this API that would would want to implement its own bandwidth control in the web app? As we uh, discussed previously, or is that like would that make use of this bandwidth estimation API or something else? Uh, I think, it, yes, I have thought about that, um, but I don't have any slides about that here. I think that's something that we should discuss, but uh, probably don't have time today to discuss it. We can take it offline. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this might be bike shedding, but uh, none of the other transports have back pointers from sender or receiver. So I would tend to. Uh, follow like wouldn't this be under the DTLS transport like the ice transport it would not be under the DTLS transport I don't think because it's it's more like the other way around where what ought to have happened mm -hmm. is the sender points to an RTP transport and the RTP transport points to DTLS transport that's the real order right but since we okay. can't go back in time and inject this we have to have right. a separate but yeah, this is bike shedding, I think. So I think I have other concerns on future slides. Yeah, we, we got a lot to go through. Lauren? Uh, yes, um, regarding that question for the RTP transport and where it should be, 
Uh, if you didn't have a bundle semantics, wouldn't very, you need them to be on the center and receivers? If you had only one single transport, then I agree, maybe it could be at a different place. But if it's not, then you do really need it um, on each uh, major section. Transceivers yes. or center or receivers. Yes, it's, it's a lot like the DTLS transport in that sense. If it's unbundled, you need separate ones. And if it's bundled, they're shared between the various bundled senders. OK, next slide. <coughs> forwarding. So there's been discussion about having some kind of APIs for forwarding. And I think that the forwarding use case just falls out naturally from the RTB transport API, where you would get packets from some remote senders and then send packets to some remote receivers, and you, you can modify to your heart cons, heart's content in between, and you can use the bandwidth estimate that we just talked about for doing rate control between the senders and receivers. So I think that anytime we want to discuss uh, forwarding, we should do it with the RTP transport and use that for forwarding. OK, so now responding to feedback from last time. The biggest one was, can we use existing M lines instead of requiring adding an M-line that I described last time. And like I just mentioned a little bit before, um, yes, we can put in .rtp transport on RTP receivers and senders. But there are a few questions we would need to answer. For example, what are you prevented from sending, aka the bumper lanes question that we talked about before? Second, how does the DMUX work on the receiving end? And third, what do we do when we mix traffic between is already being sent and what the app would like to send using RTP transport. So first question, next slide. What do you prevent it from sending? So there are some things, as I, I went through and thought, OK, what things would be invalid or valid, and what things are easy to check or not easy to check from the browser's perspective. So for example, if you try and send with a completely bogus payload type, or not bogus, but unnegotiated, it's not in the SDP, that's easy for the browser to check. But if you use a negotiated payload type, but just put in a payload that doesn't even match that payload type, like you pick 96 for Opus, but then you don't stick in anything resembling Opus, that is not easy for the browser to check. It's basically impossible. Um, similarly, you could say, all right, if you use a header extension ID 7 when it wasn't negotiated, that's easy for the browser to check. But if you put in a value that doesn't match what was negotiated, like it's the VLA header extension and you stick in some random values, that's not easy for the browser to check. For SSRCs, um, since SSRCs are typically not negotiated and MIDs are used instead, you can't really say whether a particular SSRC is allowed or not. But you could check the MID and the RID. That's not too hard. Uh, similarly, you could check that the RTCP types are negotiated unless we allow custom RTCP messages, in which case you wouldn't know what, which ones should be allowed or not allowed. But maybe you just say, hey, no custom RTCP messages for uh, RTP transports tied to an existing inline. I don't know. Uh, and lastly, the direction. Uh, if they're all receive, if all the inlines in the bundle group are receive only, maybe you don't allow sending anything. So uh, next slide. In summary, the bumper lanes uh, would basically be reduced down to unnegotiated IDs like the payload type, the header extension IDs, the mids, the rids, the RTCP types, and then also direction. And um, if we think about that, we realize that if the web app wants to send those uh, unnegotiated payload types, header extension IDs, et cetera, they could. They just have to first munch the STP. So then the question just becomes, is this worth it to have this kind of bumper lanes where um, the app can always turn off the bumper lanes effectively by adding those IDs to the STP? Should we just make it easier for it to, to turn off the bumper lanes? Harold? So uh, this this actually uh, in crosses with multiplexing. Because uh, the important thing about SDP merging is that, uh, that it tells the negotiation machinery that uh, these values are in use. So what I would be afraid of would be, you send seven because that's not a, ne a ne negotiated header extension. And then an offer answer occurs and suddenly seven is defined. So that I wouldn't, 
I would rather uh, not not make it too easy to to bump this, at least when you're when when you're multiplexing with between and uh, between uh, your generated or generated as the uh, RTP and uh, your and the stuff that comes through the old channels. There might be two modes here. Oh my God. Okay, Yanivar. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so this might be. I see you have slides coming up uh, with what the W the streams and things like that. But I fear we're already way too low level than I, I feel comfortable with. We're talking about packets and uh, individual. This it seems like a very low level API. And I guess I have some questions also. If every sender has an RTP transport, uh, does that also show up if it has a track? And so what I imagined was more of a, a new type of data channel where you can have either, well, like when is a sender uh, sending media stream track or when is it sending uh, some other pre-encoded data? And that's sort of the API that I was hoping that we would end up with where you either have a track or a writable and then you, they're mutually exclusive. But you either have either the input is a media stream track or it's uh, pre-encoded media that comes in the form of writable. So that would be the level of abstraction that I would be comfortable with, uh, as far as solving a more abstract goal of sending data, pre-encoded data, over the existing RTP channel, rather than exposing uh, a JavaScript API to say, "Hey, you send a packet now," or "Hey, you send." Uh, RTCP packet now, because I worry that's not going to be performant. Because I think in web transport, we already saw, even for datagrams, it was useful to have a writable. There's no back pressure on write on datagrams, but the benefit of having a writable is that you have a send queue, so that you uh, the sender can still feed and make sure that the send queue is sufficiently large, uh, and uh, the send queue might be on a different network process. So there's a timing delay. You can't just have an API to send individual packets, I believe, and have that be performant for throughput. So those are my concerns. So looking for a more high level, more data, uh, more, I guess, transport agnostic, if you will, as, and that we're replacing the source of RTP, not necessarily uh, the control over RTP. That makes sense. And the benefit there, I think, is that I don't think every JavaScript developer is up for uh, learning how, when to send RDB packets. <laughs> um, all right. Who is next in the queue? Florence? That would be me. I have a question. Uh, how would the API work with um, so various ways to encrypt data in an RTP packet, such as uh, cryptex, for example. Do we have visibility on the header extension IDs uh, with cryptex? And if so, how would we, um, well, if we don't, how would we validate them? Sorry, cryptex, I'm not familiar. That's uh, RTP, RTP header extension and CSRC encryption. Oh, Correct. right. Um, so I, I don't have anything. We, we haven't talked to, yet about um, the encryption of header extensions. Um, that is uh, a good topic to cover, much like um, Stefan's topic was a good one also. But I, I don't have anything here for that today. Uh, we would need significantly more time to cover uh, Topics right. like that. I put the RFC number uh, in the chat so you can have a look later. So you can research it for this topic. Just warning, the segment has uh, three minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to make it through all the slides. Hendrik? Uh, I initially saw, hey, you have you exposed the transport, you should be able to send whatever you want. But when Harald mentioned that a future negotiation could change uh, what's allowed. I think it might make more sense if you explicitly say, I'm going to use this PT, 
and here's the send method to send data on that PT. Um, I'm wondering if an approach similar to that would address both Harald's concern uh, about collisions and John Evers' concern about it being too low level. Because uh, if, if you register and then explicitly do a send, maybe this is a little bit more middle layer, or are there any downsides to that? Uh, I'm not really sure what you mean. I, I, several people have said, okay, maybe you could do it a little differently, but um, I think we need some kind of, um, I don't know if counter proposal is the right word, but like example of what you're thinking in terms of example code or maybe web IDO. I was thinking like register payload type X and then, you know, send on X data. But I don't know if that even makes sense. Hmm. So that's what I was <laughs> thinking. It, it seems like what we should do is uh, allocate significantly more time, maybe with a smaller subset of people from the working group to have a more um, design, think, think like time. group design. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Sure. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think the question about the cryptex exposes uh, an issue with this design, which is that currently we have interfaces like RTP packet and RTCP packet that you use to just set stuff. But the point is with something like Cryptex, you can't just do that. There has to be something that creates an RTP packet with SRTP applied and Cryptex applied and all of that stuff. And that that transformation can't just be a simple write. It, it's something that actually produces a fully formed RTP packet that then can be written. So it's, there's, you have to be clear about what the steps are in going from a packet to a fully formed thing on the wire. Uh, Philip? I assumed that we would be still doing SRTP encryption with any data that is put into this, right? Yes. So but but, but header extensions, would... yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, that was the question. Oh, yes. Yes, I I was, I mean, I could have done more of a review from last time, but yes, everything is encrypted and congestion controlled. Those were like requirements from last time. Yeah, but it goes back to Jan Ivar's point about use of what WG streams. What WG streams won't do something like SRTP when you call write, right? It just takes what's ever in the buffer and sends it. So that, I think that's, you're going to probably talk about that later, Peter. But that's one of the concerns is that you, if you had what WD streams, you have to be real clear about what write does. And if if it has to do the SRTP and and the cryptex and stuff, it wouldn't be classic what WD streams uh, write. But it would be write what write on the SRTP. What WG stream feeding into a well, okay. I, I I think maybe I should step back a little bit and say we have two minutes. I've gotten through like. A tiny portion of the slides and the things that should be discussed. So, we, taking 20 minutes in each uh, meeting is probably not going to be enough to make progress on this. So, we should probably um, we figure out some other Peter approach. To the working, like the weekly, like dedicate a slot to just Peter's hour trademark. <laughs> well, I, I, I think we should get. Uh, the, the yeah, people interested in designing this thing together, like uh, whatever small group, and figure out how we can iterate on it. Um, but I'm not a process guy, so uh, somebody tell yeah, me so what the right process is here. <laughs> well, we could call for an interim interim meeting, the interim between the interims that we with that is kind of the design team for this particular proposal. Just quickly, you know, you could create uh, an RTP packet object and and then pipe it to a readable, a, a writable. Uh, yes, that that's basically what we talked about last time. So, um, I I didn't do a, a significant review here because I only had twenty minutes and a lot to go through. But if we decide to have an interim interim or wherever we call it, um, then I could spend a lot more time like reviewing what we talked about before and. Um, getting everyone on the same page before delving into details. 
Also, it looks like we just didn't have enough time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I buried my question. Uh, is the transport RTP transport object present? When is it present? Is it only you have to create it? Is it always there, even for if you have a track? Well, last time, what I proposed was you have to create it, like you created a, a data channel. And the right. feedback was, could we also have it so that it's already there, along with senders and receivers, like with DTOS transport? And so that was what I was exploring here and uh, talking about the follow-up questions that come up with that, such as the bump lanes. And there are more, but like I said, we need more time. Right. I'm hearing an action for the chairs to organize a separate mind this meeting on this topic. Would it be possible to have it before the next interim so you can present your results in the December? Or is that uh, too short of a timeline? Uh, well, we already have kind of a problem with December interim being too packed. Um, so it might require a separate meeting or uh, anyway, we can talk about that offline, how we how we want to figure out, get the time. but. Also, it might be helpful to include links in the slide so to where people should go and get up. We can discuss there. I think there is a link to the repository on the slides. I know I've been able to get to it uh, that way. Maybe in the first slides uh, on the topic. Oh, thank you. I see it. Slide 33. Okay. That's not a skip. You're going to have to skip a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for clarification, like, do I have 20 minutes? Do I have 15 minutes? Do I have anything in between? I think you have uh, fif 15 minutes. Uh, it was originally for 20 minutes. It's going to be very difficult to do this in 15. Yep. Uh, I'll try to do it in 18 uh, oh. and share the load with the next person in line. So uh, hello, I'm Elad. I'm here with Guido, and we're going to talk about the three thumbs up. But we're mostly going to be talking about the mute aspects of three thumbs up. Uh, so first of all, what's three thumbs up, right? Um, what we've got here uh, is a case I'm sorry, uh, three thumbs up is the name that we gave to the general phenomenon where basically the user agent, the web application and the operating system all stumble over all on top of each other in their mad rush to try and help the user accomplish whatever they want to accomplish, right? So in here, we've got uh, three different screenshots and you can see that uh, on the top, it's the application. On the right, it's the user agent, Safari in this case, and on the left, it's the operating system, Chrome OS in this case, and they all offer the same um, controls for uh, controlling the mic and the camera. And in this case, you can't have all three because Safari does not currently run on Chrome OS, but you could imagine that one day, if native Chrome did that, uh, on Mac OS and Mac OS also introduced something to that effect. You could have all three of them all playing the same on the same soccer field, right? So these are the entities that are uh, concerned here. And what functionality are we talking about? So first, there's the control of peripheral devices like mics and cameras. You can control them in all sorts of ways. You can change the volume. You can mute them, mostly mute. Uh, we've also got the effects, right? Background blur, lighting adjustments, reactions when you do that on macOS recently. Um, so it's a general phenomenon. So today, uh, let's focus on muting, please. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the problems is that users often have the wrong mental model here, right? Uh, they kind of expect that all of the controls just mute or unmute, which is an unsophisticated but a reasonable uh, kind of way to expect things to work. You press on a button, it mutes. You press it again, it unmutes. The interaction between the different uh, entities is not something that the normal user needs to worry about. They're doing other productive uh, things. Now, 
it's only one of several uh, problems that could happen, right? Because even a very savvy user can just forget that they muted something in another button, right? They've got this button right in front of them. There's the other one. Uh, they could think that they're still muted while they're not. They can think they're un. You understand? So it's unnecessarily complex. Next slide, please. It's unnecessarily complex because uh, the reality is that it's not multiple different toggles all touching the same functionality, but rather it's a stream or it's a path that can have multiple gates. And you can only go through this path if all of the gates are open. And uh, in our case here, it's mic, but it's also camera and it's also uh, screen sharing could be any kind of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, uh, here's a quote from a user I've just made up, but uh, trust me, it's very realistic. The user says, I spoke, but nobody could hear me. I was not muted. And this is a pain user. And so we should not underestimate the pain to the web application vendor because web application vendors really care about users. And we should also not underestimate the pain that the user faces because this could be during a meeting, they could be terribly embarrassed to be seen as so, uh, uh, tech unsavvy. This could be a job interview. They could be pitching clients. Uh, and if we actually looked at the entire world and look at all of the cumulative mo uh, minutes lost to these scrambles to find exactly what's wrong, uh, I think that we will come up with a significant number. So I think it's a problem worth solving. Next slide, please. So I would like to uh, make things a bit clearer by defining a couple of terms, right? Uh, it's a very simple term, it's upstream. The hardware is upstream of the OS, which is upstream of the UA, which is upstream of the web application. Okay, so basically, uh, media flows from the hardware to OS, to user agent, to web application. Next slide, please. So ideally, uh, I think that we would want to, sir, uh, to define two types of controls here, right? Oh, sorry, two types of new API surfaces. One for exposing stream to downstream uh, state to downstream entities, right? And then the downstream entities can choose whether and how to even reflect this to the user, right? So you could imagine that if Meet, for example, knew that it was muted by the operating system, it could show some kind of UX to the user, or it might choose not to. It's out of scope for us, but many applications would, would actually choose to do that. Now, if some of the state is private, we can deal with that. We'll get to that later. So that was number one, exposure. Number two is control. Uh, now, we might want to also expose a control that says that the downstream entity, like the, um, like the application can ask the user agent to unmute. Uh, this could be subject to a user prompt or might not. We can discuss that later. It might need a user gesture. Uh, the upstream entity might choose to just reject this request for reasons that's with, uh, kept secret with it, like a heuristic or if a phone call is going on at the same time or anything like that. Uh, but the uh, application would be able to ask the user agent for that. The user agent can always ask the operating system. That's outside of our scope. And this request could sometimes even be relayed uh, through layers. Next slide, please. So in terms of prioritization, uh, on the GitHub uh, uh, discussion, we had a little bit of a misunderstanding. So I would like to just uh, clarify my position again. I'm sorry, not a misunderstanding, disagreement. So I think that exposing state uh, is more important than changing it. Because generally speaking, if you don't know what the state is, why would you even try to change it, right? You're not gonna expose some kind of button that says, hey user, keep clicking here and we will unmute whenever necessary, right? What you are actually going to do as a web application is when you detect that you're muted, you're gonna show that to the user and offer some kind of control that when the user presses, then you would call a request unmute or any other API that would control state. So next slide, please. So now you might say, great, but you should already know that, right? Why do you need any new API surfaces? You've got the mute event, just use that. And then we've solved half the problem and we only need to uh, deal with controlling the state. And here I uh, would have to disagree uh, because uh, for reasons that are 
uh, unknown to me because this predated me, uh, the mute event was actually defined to be any kind of temporary inability to provide media. And I've just uh, copied two places in the spec that says that. So first, the mute event says the media stream track object source is temporarily unable to provide data. OK, so there is nothing here about the user action or intent or anything like that. It could be a malfunction. It could be CPU congestion. It could really be anything. Uh, Yaniva, I'm sorry, I'll just go through everything because my time is short here and then I'll ask for, uh, for you. I'll go back and uh, talk to you about this. Second, uh, muted refers to the input to the media stream track. If live samples are not made available to the media stream track, it is muted. So basically the same thing in some other place in the spec. Next slide, please. So my uh, concrete proposal would be as follows, right? Uh, we keep the mute event as a generic event, but when that event is fired, uh, we make sure that we expose a bit of extra data. Uh, we define mute source, which could be unspecified user agent operating system, and you could also think maybe hardware. Then uh, we pack that into a mute reason, where the mute reason is A, the source, and B, something I call potentially actionable. It's not a good name, we can discuss that later, and I will explain later what it means, okay? So first, you get the mute source. Now, one more thing is that you get a sequence of mute sources because you could imagine that the user could mute in multiple places, right? The user could go ahead. They're really interested in muting. They're going to say something very, uh, very uh, privacy sensitive. So they mute in the operating system or in the user agent and in the web application. They may, in that case, get mute reasons. And I'm sorry about the typo there. So get mute reasons is going to take care of that. Next slide, please. So I suggest that uh, basically we would change very slightly the definition of the mute event to say that you fire a new event whenever the set of reasons changes and the new one is a non-empty and you fire the unmute event whenever the set of reasons becomes empty again, in which case, of course, you're unmuted. Next slide, please. I'm almost uh, to the end. I thank you. So. Um, some privacy concerns were voiced on the GitHub thread. I do not, uh, I have not yet heard, uh, I've not yet heard one that I found convincing. Um, the one that I heard that was uh, concrete uh, was about users getting incoming calls and you wouldn't want to expose that to the uh, web application. I agree that ideally you would not want to do that. And I think that if you just say that the source is the operating system, uh, most applications are not going to be able to correlate that to an incoming uh, call because the user could still mute in the uh, operating system. Like it could be user action, it could be an incoming call, it could be the user uh, firing a new, um, uh, you know, starting a new application, a new application just uh, overriding whoever has um, some access. Like there are many other reasons. So I think. Uh, we, this is not a real concern so long as we uh, limit uh, the possible values of source. Initially, there were a lot of uh, values, including operating system choice, operating system uh, error. So I think that if we just get away from that and just say operating system, that should fix that. Uh, I will hand over the mic uh, for you guys to uh, contradict me here. I just want to go through, uh, get through all of the slides. Uh, yes, Yanivar, I remember you were first. Uh, then just two more slides, please. Uh, so, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, request unmute is the mechanism that I propose uh, for use uh, for unmuting. Basically, it goes like this: it goes on the track. Uh, you call and when you crawl uh, request unmute, uh, there is a prompt. Uh, sorry, uh, Dominic, I won't be able to read that live. Uh, so, when a web application calls request unmute, uh, then it's up to the user agent to display a prompt to the user and ask if they really want to unmute or not. Uh, we can consider whether such a prompt is actually necessary. My uh, initial take is that probably yes, but I'm willing to uh, think about this. And it seems very likely that this should require a user gesture, uh, which is uh, necessary, but not a sufficient uh, condition, obviously, because the user gesture could have been anything. Uh, next slide, please. That's the last one. Thank you. So uh, I promised to say what potentially actionable means. And I just want to say, so basically admit we've got these uh, three icons already. The leftmost one means you're not muted. 
The middle one means you're muted in the application. And the third one means we don't, we are not receiving any frames. This looks suspicious, or we're only receiving black frames, right? Now, you could imagine that a reasonable web application could use the rightmost one to just say, hey, you're muted in something that we cannot control, right? So in this case, when you receive the mute event, if it is actionable or potentially actionable, uh, you the web application would show the middle uh, icon to the user. And if it's clicked, they would recall request unmute. But the rightmost one would be an unclickable button because the application knows that there is no chance that request unmute could have any kind of effect. Whereas with the middle one, it might have the desirable effect or it might not. Modulo, of course, the discussion of incoming uh, uh, phone calls, which I think that we can actually handle. So next slide, please. And I relinquish the mic. All right, uh, I think I'm first on the queue. So uh, thank you first Stella, for an excellent presentation. I really loved the way you presented it. And I, I think it covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm hearing a couple of proposals. There's um, mute reason and whether it's actionable or not. And then there's a, a method to request unmute. Uh, let me do request unmute first. I'm in favor, I think that looks good. Uh, for mute reason, however, I, I feel uh, I'm worried it's exposed to. I, I also like mute reason but I think it should only have two states. And I think uh, we shouldn't expose specifically uh, things like mentioning operating system and stuff like that. I don't think, even though that might help someone who joins the call initially, and you could send the, the I guess the application could tell them like, go fix it in your browser, go fix it in your OS. I don't think uh, you need that level of detail and that there's some correlation of, uh, these these actions outside of the browser can be correlated across origins, so we should avoid those. I think all the, they really care about is whether the user, whether the source of the mute was the user or the up or the not the user, right? If it's temporal. And uh, on the slide you mentioned from the spec, it did mention a lot of cases, specific cases that I had in mind for the mute event. Um, so. I would be happy with some, something that was basically your actionable or not actionable. Uh, maybe we could call it, I suggested user or temporal as the two names. We can always bike shed names. So I think that's the limit of information that we need to expose. Um, on the last slide regarding the controls, um, I think uh, I had an epiphany in the, in the issue, even though it's a long issue to read. I don't think we need an API for that. I think we can overload the toggle mic. We already have toggle microphone and toggle camera in the media session API, uh, which actually lets uh, the operating system on phones control the mute state already, the mute button directly from say the lock screen on your phone. So I think we should, uh, I think that allows us to talk about that separately. Um, I didn't quite get that about the media session API, but because the time is short, I will not try to understand that now, but thanks. Uh, and let's revisit that later. Uh, with respect to, um, your first argument about not needing operating system, etc. I think that uh, it would actually be nice. Uh, so first, I don't foresee all operating systems uh, extending such an API to the application immediately, uh, and some of them never at all. And some users are always going to have an old operating system, or but with a new browser. So you could imagine that this some applications will want to just instruct the user of, hey, you appear to be muted. Uh, here's where you probably want to, uh, to fix that. Additionally, I am not 100% sure that uh, all applications will ever want to call a request uh, unmute because that's a bit of a scary uh, thing to do, right? So even if you are, uh, even sure. if there is a prompt involved, right, yeah. you're still potentially impacting the user's uh, mute state in another application. So some web applications might choose to never do that. And I well, think that having some kind, uh, just a second, I think that having the ability to differentiate between operating system and user agent and instruct the user accordingly is valuable. And uh, I think that we should only avoid that if we can think of credible privacy concerns. Uh, and we should, of course, take the time to think about this. But if we fail to think of any, I don't see any reason to avoid that. Well, quick answer is uh, if the browser can't unmute, then it should blame the browser. And if the browser has a good reason, it can't. It's up to the browser then to inform it if it's in the user agent. The web application doesn't need to know the difference. It doesn't need what's generally we don't allow web applications to know what's behind the user agent. I 
agree that this uh, addresses the concern of having an older operating system or one that never chooses to offer that uh, ability. I don't think it addresses the concern of some web applications just not wanting to call request unmute. Uh, but I, we have short time and I will hand it over to you, Anne. Yep, so I would say that we all have agreement that we want request unmute. And um, we might have differences in the way we might uh, handle the error model and so on. But I think it's really that that we should concentrate on and have the exact model we want for this one. And then figure out what is needed for the web application to actually call it. And if it's not scary to call it, then we might not want to expose anything. If it's scary, then we might want to expose something or, or not. Uh, we will get to the sorry. Boolean. If it's if it's scary, you, you said that calling request unmute is scary, and ah. uh, maybe it is, maybe it's not. So we need to figure out precisely what request unmute would, would do. Uh, with regards to the Boolean, uh, in the thread there are different definitions of what would be the Boolean. Some of the definitions are not implementable in iOS, and that's a concern uh, because then if you're not be able to if you're not able to implement it, you, you need to fake it, you need to, to do something, and it might skew web applications. So we might be cautious there. So that's why I really think we should uh, focus on request and mute. And I would also say that request mute would be nice as well. So that's it. So hopefully we can work on request and mute first, at least in, in uh, terms of PR and spec editing. Harold, is it okay if I just respond first? Because otherwise I'll forget. Go ahead. Uh, so two things uh, about requ request mute. I think that this is an orthogonal discussion. My uh, first uh, impression is that you probably don't want to allow that because it's going to mute other applications and they just don't see the need for it right now. But I think because it's orthogonal, we can always have it later. It should not block the request and mute API. Um, for the uh, question of the Boolean, uh, Bernard, are you able to uh, maybe move to slide 66? Uh, one more, or maybe, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what if we changed mute source to say unspecified and upstream, and we didn't actually expose uh, whether it was the operating system or the user agent, at least initially, we can discuss that later, but initially it would effectively be a Boolean between the old meaning of uh, mute, which was whatever, and the new one, which says like, hey, it's either user agent, uh, operating system, hardware, some something that's uh, that overrides the application. Would that work for you, Yuen? Uh, I, I would like to understand precisely how you get the source, the Boolean, and then whether you call request unmute or whether you what, what UI you, you change and so on. And that's based on basically defining request unmute. Um, so that, that's why I would, I, I really think we, we are not um, losing time in defining request unmute, and that will help drive a discussion for this, this Boolean value. And I, I'm I not opposed to it. I, I'm just not sure exactly what we are trying to, to get at. And uh, for me, it will help to define request and you to precisely understand what, what you're after. I've got an email from a developer in the Meet team uh, that can uh, might shed some light. Unfortunately, it's going to take me some time to do it, so you'll have to rely on my memory here, OK? And he mentioned that it is not uncommon for users to spend the entire call, almost the entire call, muted. Uh, now. I'm going to subvert his intention here a bit uh, because he meant that, hey, by the time that you unmute, uh, the user doesn't want to interact with the operating system. So whatever. Um, I would argue that the uh, Boolean here, the mute reason, uh, would be useful for even for a web application uh, and for a user of that web application if they never call request unmute because you need to be able to update uh, the web uh, application UX to reflect that if the user is going to start speaking now, uh, nobody's going to hear him. And this very thing, even if the user never chooses to unmute, they need to know that. They need to know that it's safe for them to speak to their spouse who has just entered the room and discuss the diapers during a meeting uh, because nobody's going to hear them. And sending 
uh, contradictory statements to that effect uh, to the user is detrimental. And this alignment between the upstream and the downstream uh, without ever introducing any measure of control would already uh, give users value. Uh, I'm not sure if it's you next or Harold. Harold, you're muted. Case in point. Uh, sorry, I, I, I lost my point. Uh, UN, do you find this point about request and mute uh, not always being part of the uh, show compelling? Um, not really. The, the fact is that in current OSs, um, capture gets muted only uh, based on user actions. Uh, it's true that there are some specs like image capture that are saying, hey, you should set muted uh, because you are taking image capture. Uh, and this is a very, um, in that case, I understand that you do not want actually uh, the web app to understand that the user muted because it's really image capture that is muting. Um, I'm questioning for that specific case, the decision of the spec. And that's why I'm thinking that maybe the other cases where it's muted, but user did not want to mute are very similar in fact, and that whenever there's a capture track, we, we could all almost always say when the track is muted, the user decided to mute, basically, in one way or but the other. Would it not be privacy preserving to, uh, finish my sentence and give it to uh, Guido, would it not be privacy preserving to just have an enum with two values or a boolean that says is uplink or something like that? Like, it seems like that would allow applications to be spec compliant always and solve the issue. So, so uplink would be uh, OS versus user agent. Is it that you're? Uh, it could be user agent. Or it would be anything except for a temporary seizure of uh, frames. But temporary so it would seizure be of frames. Operating system, user agent, or even hardware. Okay, T temporary seizure of frame to me is not something that that is shown by muted. Basically, that's my understanding. So, if it's that that you're after, then I would agree we could expose somehow uh, the differences. Um, but I'm not very clear about the definition of this boolean. So that, that's why I think we, and honestly, I think that the, the case that everybody talks about is the case where user muted. So it's the case where you, you want it to be actionable and so on. It's not like the temporal seizure thing. I will hand it over to Guido because if I say anything more, there won't be time. No, I want to point out that uh, yeah, it would be great if if the if mute works the way you says, but that's not what the spec says, and that's not what the implementations do. Uh, I mean, maybe some work that way, but no, Chrome certainly doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, anything that that would cause the track not to get frames would cause the 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 track to be muted, even. Even an optimization where you temporarily suspend capture just because it's convenient would, would cost you. So and that's that's what the spec says. So that's why why applications don't use that that attribute to to reflect to interpret it as the user actually wanted to move. So we're ten minutes over time. So we're uh, do we want to continue for this for five minutes and drop extended use cases? I, I think so, because we're not going to get very far with extended use cases with five minutes. So. OK, we have more more on the queue. OK, thank you for uh, for donating this time. So I think I'm next. Uh, uh, Bernard, can you move to slide 65? <clears throat> Is that a useful uh, of the spec there? So it does actually talk about uh, uh with the examples here uh the user pushing a pushing a physical mute button on the microphone the user closing a laptop lid with an embedded camera the user toggling a control in the operating system the user clicking a mute button in the user agent chrome uh you know so it th also says et all et these... et it, it says etc at the end that, that no point does yeah. it say that this is an exhaustive list well maybe we should fix the spec then because uh i don't think I think the goal here was always to include uh, all of these are the user agent meeting on behalf of the user. And, but 
you know, uh, closing laptop lid. And there are some cases where I agree that uh, we've speculated. I mentioned um, if you unmute, for instance, in a background tab, uh, Firefox uh, has a mode where we don't show the camera light necessarily uh, for uh, when you we have all tracks muted. So there are some cases, and also for page load, I think we kind of we dropped the ball on uh, use a gesture for get user media, and we have to live with that. It's too late to fix. But this is an opportunity to fix that, where, for instance, if someone asks for get user media on page load, the use agent could uh, improve privacy by muting them by default until there's some interaction, for example. So yes, I agree there are cases where there will be, as you call, temporal mute. And I think that's the only thing you need to know, whether it's, this was a temporal mute that's going to resolve itself and the user can't affect it, versus this is a user, this is actually the user muting from a different uh, button. I you have those two, I think it can resolve most conflicts. I think that it's going to be more painful to change the spec uh, and break uh, existing implementations or other possible implementations. I think it's going to be very easy to instead, uh, if you go to 66, please, uh, Bernard. I think that just adding this uh, Boolean of uh, it's like is uplink, uh, which will essentially mean anything that is uh intentional right or no sorry not anything that's intentional but um but that's you say though, mute. Like, it's a user button uplink sorry I, uh, it's a I'm user not sure user, button I, I don't want to bike shed on the name but i i doubt that uh we can always say it's the user because it could also uh be an, another you know another application that has the permission to toggle the uh, mic off uh the user's admin, like uh, it's not necessarily the user going to the UX and changing it. So I, I think it would be a bit misleading. Uh, I, I realize that we're close to bike shedding here. So I think that we're probably close to agreement. Uh, I'm I'm happy to provide slide next meeting uh, to show toggle microphone and toggle camera and that, how that could be used to more directly sync up uh, the toggle, mute toggles with OS toggles. If that helps. But I also agree that a mute source has some value by itself, but, uh, but not with so many values. Not necessarily so many values, but uh, at least if we have this mute reason interface, we can always extend it. And uh, I think that even if initially it only holds a single Boolean, it would be good, mm -hmm. to, good to have an interface uh, for future proofing. But I'm also not sure why you have both an enum and a Boolean, because that's just doubling the states. So instead um, of three, you have six states here. Uh, it's uh, to uh, stop a combinatorial, uh, you know, explosion of uh, having operating system, but actionable operating system, mm -hmm. but not actionable, actionable error, non-actionable error, you know. Well, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, uh, operate, how our operating system. So errors. if there's a, yeah. it, it's not very likely, but if there is an operating system, uh, you know, error, mm -hmm. like the drivers crashed, you know, it's like something like that. But um, I, I think that Guido and Harald want to speak. Yeah, so uh, I finally remember what I was wanting to say to you when that uh, OS uh, capabilities change over time. So we shouldn't uh, uh, conclude that just because one OS doesn't do an, a particular thing today, the same true same will be true of uh, of all OSs. Uh, uh, the same will be true of the OS in the future. So let's. Uh, tolerate uh, OSs that uh, don't do this, but let's not wrap, wrap our, head, our heads too much around the fact that there are limits in the short run. Guido. Uh, I think Guido went, uh, was uh, scheduled to go next. Uh, just want to ask uh, any of your idea of using the media session event is just for using the event or somehow uh, interacting with the media session API. So the the purpose there is uh, the the for context toggle microphone and uh, camera in media session allow uh, a web page to basically have controls on the lock screen of a phone that affects their toggle. And but unfortunately, that actually also lets a malicious website lie about those controls. You can tell that microphone is on uh, is off when it's on, for example. Uh, 
it's a tricky problem to solve because the user wants to know whether there, anyone can hear them, which involves, of course, both capture and also anyone, meaning remote participants, if you're in a meeting call, for example. So it's a tricky thing to handle. So my proposal would be that when the user agent, is in, in, uh, when the operating system or the browser allows the user to mute from outside, then we also enforce this with, a, with an additional by muting the tracks in that case. And that way, uh, you can already differentiate to whether this is uh, coming from the user or not, because you'll you'll get mute event first, and then you also get a toggle microphone event from the OS. Okay, uh, folks, we're two minutes from finishing, and I think we should talk a little bit about what we do next, because um, obviously we've got a lot more discussion on this topic. Plus, we have I think two topics that we didn't even get to during the meeting. So uh, should we be scheduling another meeting in December? Because I think December agenda is already full. What do, what do people suggest we do? Harold, do you have any thoughts? Well, well what is it full with? Maybe <laughs> uh, it should come first. Uh, a lot had a bunch of topics. Um, I know Guido, I you asked the additional uh, session that we didn't have time for. So I'm just wondering what the we can increase the time of the December meeting. We can schedule another meeting uh, to try to. Are we already have a proposal for another for, meeting what for, people, for for RTP? Uh, so I think right, or is it? Would it be a working group meeting? Uh, I would be okay with um, another meeting in December, so long as it's early in December, because I uh, have a lot of vacation days uh, left over that I am compelled to take. So we could, uh, we could, for example, schedule it early in December, um, and mostly stuff we didn't get to. This week, that could be like an hour or and a half or something would probably do it. Okay, uh, chairs will back figure it out. Okay. Cheers. Bye. See you soon.